Hearthstone Battlegrounds may be the first pay-to-win auto battler. Microsoft is taking aim at Google Stadia and a bunch more on today's episode of The Roundup. Hey everyone and welcome back to another Roundup episode. As always, be sure to like, sub and ring that bell to keep the YouTube algorithm happy. And with that, let's get into the news. During BlizzCon, the Hearthstone team announced their take on the popular auto battler genre, Hearthstone Battlegrounds, a new game mode for Hearthstone. Now, this recently has entered beta and many players have expressed concern at how basically Blizzard have been monetizing the game thus far. And it really is not a good look. So while Battlegrounds like Hearthstone is, you know, actually a free-to-play game, Blizzard has implemented a bonus system that requires players to obtain packs in order to unlock additional features. Now, these packs are tied to the most recent Hearthstone expansion, which in this case is um, Dragons of Descent, despite it uh, not actually being out yet, and the bonuses actually resetting after each expansion. Now, of the features, the one that's really causing the most upset is that by earning 20 packs, you basically basically unlock the ability to choose between three heroes at the start of a match instead of two. Now, each hero has their own specific skill set, so I mean, like, as you'd expect, a third choice does allow for a significant competitive advantage over players who only have the two options. Now, what's a bit more frustrating here is there's currently not really that much in the way of ways to actually earn the packs in-game. Quests that reward packs are quite limited, so obtaining through gameplay could take a while, and also Descent of Dragons packs, they're not purchasable directly with in-game gold yet, so the best way for players to get the 20 packs before launch I mean, it's to buy the 60-pack Descent of Dragons pre-purchase bundle for $50. So it's kind of clear that's what Blizzard are incentivizing here. And then, of course, with the bonuses resetting after every expansion, you're going to have to re-earn those things multiple times a year. It's almost baking a subscription-like element into Hearthstone, which, I mean, is something that they have... Uh, they've certainly faced criticism for in the past for just... Really, Hearthstone being a very expensive CCG to play. Then another common complaint is that the Hearthstone packs that are required to earn the Battlegrounds bonus content, well, they've got nothing to do with Battlegrounds. Like, you don't use them in Battlegrounds. If a player only wants to play Battlegrounds, well, they still have to play Hearthstone's main modes in order to earn packs, or alternatively just, you know, purchase packs they're not going to use with real money so they get features in Battlegrounds. It's honestly quite weird. Um, and I think what's noteworthy here is that, well, Blizzard are the first dev to try this sort of uh, paywalled approach in an auto battler. Say, League of Legends' is Teamfight Tactics that I've been playing recently. It's only got cosmetic purchases purchases like, uh, you know, hero board skins. So this really is a per showing from Blizzard and I mean, thankfully, this is in beta. They really need to amend this and make this more reasonable, because right now, I think it is, yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. Next up, though, Microsoft's most recent show ended up having quite a lot of info for us. So, aside from a slew of new game announcements, including new IP from Rare and Obsidian, which is pretty exciting, the biggest news of the day, I think, is related to Xbox Game Pass and the upcoming Project X Cloud. So, yeah, Microsoft are going very hard on Xbox Game Pass. We've got 50 titles ahead of the service, but we've also got some idea of the additional member benefits. It's kind of interesting. So Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, which of course includes Xbox Live, is getting a introductory offer of three months for $1. Also then, for a limited time, subscribers will be able to redeem a month of EA Access, three months of Discord Nitro, and six months of Spotify Premium. It's a bit wild. I mean, Game Pass has pretty much always been a good value for money, but getting those additional benefits, that's that really is quite serious. Although that said, on the Spotify front, I mean, it would be pretty good for Spotify. They are currently struggling against um, Apple Music in the US, I believe. So you really can see how strategically this would be a pretty darn good move for Spotify. They would just get a whole, a whole bunch of people onto their service for six months, which really would boost up their numbers. It's clear that Microsoft are putting a hell of a lot into Games Pass. So, uh, well, why? Well, here's where it really gets serious. The presentation also contained the announcement that Game Pass will be integrated into Microsoft's xCloud streaming service when it releases in 2020. And we've also been led to believe via an interview with um, Kareem Chaudhry, I believe, that, uh, I mean... It like, there's nothing super firm there, but if you read in between the lines of the interview, it kind of does suggest that PC games will be on xCloud which would overall paint this to be quite, well, basically quite a massive bundle. 
I mean, by that stage, it would be a pretty ridiculous amount of games with xCloud and, you know, multiple platforms in terms of, like, the sources for those games. And this all comes around the same time that, well, Google are preparing for next week's Stadia launch. And, uh, I mean, Stadia's initial success, and I'm sure there'll be some there, but they're only going to be that because, well, they're the only one of the new crop of streaming services that are, like, you know, will be out. Google are really trying to rush that thing, but it does not have a lot of features. There's a lot of stuff missing, and the content library is honestly pretty darn pathetic. Whereas Microsoft can just say, hey, Game Pass, well, it's got xCloud in it now. That's uh, really cheap per month, and it's got, you know, a stupid amount of games. I mean, if Microsoft do that, I think that really will be, I mean, I just don't even know how much of a compelling case I could even see for Stadia in that particular future marketplace. Yeah, sure, I mean, clicking in a YouTube trailer and just like having a window expand so you can play the video game, ah, that's kind of cool, but uh, that doesn't really matter though. Like, it doesn't matter in the face of one pretty reasonable monthly price to just have a far, far larger library of content, and that really does seem to be the winning strategy that Microsoft are onto. Okay, moving on, the PC version of Red Dead Redemption 2 was not in a great state when it released last week. The unexpected exit error has been a frustrating one for many players, and Rockstar's attempts at fixes I mean, they haven't really been working out that well so far. Small patches were issued, yes, but they had a limited effect for some people, right? Just, they really were not making headway. But bigger patches came through this week. It contains a pretty darn vast amount of changes that are all seemingly aimed at improving the player experience. Now, there's too many to just, like, go into in depth with this video, but uh, basically it's graphics, performance, stability, controls, UI, and just general issues. It's pretty much everything. Responses so far to it have been mixed, though. Some users are still saying that they have issues, while others are now saying that the patch has given them pretty much perfect performance for their hardware. So, overall, I'd say this. It looks like Red Dead Redemption 2 still has a ways to go before everyone who actually bought the game can play it in an acceptable fashion, but the situation is looking up. Personally, I, I, I mean, I don't think I'd recommend people buy it now if that's a game that they really do want to play. I'd probably recommend waiting for a few more patches once this is just a bit more smoothed out. Then next, we've got a really nice indie story. So we're a couple of months on from the introduction of Steam's new discoverability features, and it actually appears that they've had a positive impact on the community. So for the recently announced Kingdom Management Sim, Yes, Your Grace from No More Robots, Mike Rose, who's their founder, revealed uh, on Twitter that about 40% of the visits to the game's Steam page have actually came from discoverability. So the new updates that Valve made. Moreover, the team actually can confirm that Yes, Your Grace has more wish lists than any of their previous games at their launches. And of course, sure, Mike Rose's experience, that's not going to speak for all indie developers, but it is encouraging for those who want to get their games seen on Steam. Steam's new recommendation system, just to fill you in on that, it is a lot more personalized based on your own habits than uh, the previous one. And basically the idea is that it just shows you stuff that you probably want to play based on your past history. And if this is going to just do like a steady uptick to indie sales, I think that'll be a pretty darn good thing. I think for me, what's the most interesting about this is the traditional discoverability systems, they rely on trends, right? They rely on clicks, they rely on basically like how how much general awareness of, you know, of a product is there. And normally, well, that comes from a marketing campaign. And that's really something that the typical indie cannot do as much of. I think that if this new system is able to just do hyper targeted like discoverability, that's that really could change the game on Steam for Indies. I mean, if you're getting more views and those views, like the actual traffic that's being driven to your game's uh, Steam page, if that's more targeted, then that's probably going to, you know, lead to like a higher conversion rate for wish lists, and that's going to feed back positively into the algorithm. And I've got to wonder if you track these changes and the ramifications of them over a year or two, I, you know, I'd just be very interested. Like, what is the dollar value of essentially free marketing that this new discoverability system will have given to indie devs? Uh, I mean, I have no idea. It's just speculation right now, but I think it's a very, very interesting topic indeed. And then finally, let's wrap it up with a little bit of a quick fire story on the developer and publisher Starbreeze, who this week have unveiled their plan to pay back $40 million in debt. Now, this plan basically involves paying everything that is owed to creditors since December of last year. 
which is when Starbreeze filed for its reconstruction. Now, this is going to see their creditors divided into two categories, those who have been owed more than 107 grand and then minor ones. Now, those in the latter group of, you know, under 107 grand, they're going to get the choice between having their money returned in five years with interest or one year without interest. And this whole plan is still awaiting approval from the Stockholm District Court, but Starbreeze do expect a decision to be made soon. And if the plan is approved, then things might actually start looking up for Starbreeze, which, uh, I mean... It, the, the, the year they've had, the two years they've had, has been absolutely wild with that, like, the Walking Dead game and just all the disasters. So it looks like, right, Payday 3 in a few years might actually come out as planned. Of course, if they can resolve this current problem, and it seems like they're making steps to do so. But anyway, that's it for the news. Be sure to let me know what you thought about the stories in today's video down below. And with that, I will see you next time.